for NJ Spotlight News, provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, the U.S. Department of Ed opens an ethnic discrimination investigation at Rutgers Newark. Meanwhile, the university suspends their chapter of Students for Justice in Palestine. What you see now is an, a, a nationwide campaign waged by Israel advocacy organizations and elected officials to try to target and shut down Students for Justice in Palestine. Plus, a coalition of Jersey progressive groups are calling on candidates in the 2024 U.S. Senate race to help end the party line on primary ballots. We respect their own internal party processes. We just think that that campaigning or electioneering should stop at the voters' ballot. And if your child wants their own social media account, they may just need your parental consent. Completely irresponsible. Uh, in the way they conduct themselves in terms of engaging minors, addicting minors to the use of it in very calculated ways. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us on this Wednesday night. I'm Brianna Venozzi. We begin with a federal investigation being launched at Rutgers University in Newark. The U.S. Department of Education on Monday opened an ethnic discrimination investigation, according to Politico NJ, which was first to report the probe. Rutgers joins a growing list of universities under federal scrutiny since the Israel-Hamas war began in October and, like many other schools, has faced criticism recently for its response to rising cases of anti-Semitism. The Department of Ed declined to comment and isn't specifying on the nature of the investigation, but the move follows a wave of fallout at other higher ed campuses, including the ouster of UPenn's President Liz McGill and backlash against the leader of Ivy League schools. New Jersey congressional members sent letters to Rutgers and other state colleges expressing concern and requesting plans for addressing anti-Semitic incidents. Meantime, the Rutgers New Brunswick campus became the first public higher ed institution to suspend the Students for Justice in Palestine chapter this week, accusing members of violating several university policies. As Melissa Rose Cooper reports, the actions are intensifying a fierce debate around free speech versus hate speech on college campuses. We do criticize the human rights elements of what's going on in Palestine right now. That should not be, uh, you know, categorized as anti-Semitic. Yet Dina Saeed Ahmed, communications director for the New Jersey chapter of the Council of Islamic Relations, says that's exactly what's happening following Rutgers New Brunswick's decision to suspend the organization Students for Justice in Palestine. In a letter dated December 11th, the Office of Student Conduct indicates the suspension is in response to multiple complaints of gatherings and events that have caused people on campus to feel unsafe. Members are accused of disrupting classes, a program, meals, and student studying. There are also allegations of vandalism occurring at the Rutgers Business School. It doesn't, it doesn't seem justifiable that they would suspend a student group for uh, civil disobedience work when civil disobedience is um, part and parcel of the college experience. So it's, um, it's a little shocking, it's worrying, um, and it feels very McCarthyist. Members of SJP calling out Rutgers for its suspension of their organization, maintaining all of their actions have included peaceful protests. Today, SJP releasing a statement saying in part, none of the allegations are substantiated by date, testimony, or description of incidents. According to the letter, the allegations reflect complaints by other Rutgers students, faculty, or staff which may be no more than a speech disagreement. Nothing in the letter indicates how these allegations pose a substantial and immediate threat to the safety and well-being of others. I think it's shocking and appalling. It appears to be a targeted suspension based, based on viewpoint discrimination. The Rutgers New Brunswick SJP chapter is one of the latest to be suspended in the country. Brandeis, Columbia, and George Washington, all private universities, recently suspended SJP chapters on their campuses. Audrey Trushke, 
professor of history at Rutgers University, Newark, and chair of the Rutgers AAUP AFT Academic Freedom Committee, says acts like these violate everyone's First Amendment right to freedom of speech. Many of the students who are part of Students for Justice in Palestine are part of minoritized communities. They're Muslim students, Arab students, Palestinian students. Um, and these groups are under heavy pressure due to a, a broader a broader sense of bigotry and especially Islamophobia that is sweeping America right now. And I think to take this sort of action and further stigmatize members of those communities at this time potentially does place them in harm's way. Which Alex Kane says could also mean harm for some Jewish students, since a number of them are involved in Palestinian advocacy groups. He believes it's important to distinguish between anti-Semitism and criticism about a government. Right, And I understand why some students might feel attacked, because for the first time in their life, they're hearing that Israel is an apartheid or colonial state. These are deeply uncomfortable words as if you're a Jewish student who has never heard that, who can, who, who would never dare to think that their community is supporting these actions. And so they think it's anti-Semitism. They're also told it's anti-Semitism by the mainstream Jewish community. But I think we need to disentangle that and recognize that we need to be able to criticize the actions of governments, no matter if they're Jewish Muslim or Christian. Members of SJP are now demanding Rutgers immediately reinstate its chapter as well as issue a public apology. Rutgers maintains it's committed to providing an inclusive environment and allowing an exchange of ideas as long as everyone is safe. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. Meanwhile, President Biden this morning held his first in-person meeting with the families of Americans being held hostage by Hamas in Gaza, including the family of 19-year-old Tenafly High School graduate Idan Alexander. The Biden administration says it estimates there are eight remaining hostages with American citizenship. They include seven men and one woman, and it's vowing to bring each one home. Today's meeting at the White House comes after pressure has been increasing on the president to restrain Israel attacks on Gaza. The Hamas-run health ministry says those strikes have killed more than 15,000 Palestinians since the start of the war. President Biden has fiercely supported Israel's right to defend itself against Hamas, which killed 1,200 Israelis in a surprise attack on October 7th. But at a fundraiser on Tuesday, President Biden spoke bluntly about the conflict, saying Israel's, quote, indiscriminate bombing is causing the country to lose international support. More police oversight could be coming to New Jersey, but only in certain towns. Lawmakers this week advanced a bill that'll increase accountability for cops who are in trouble by creating local civilian complaint review boards and granting them subpoena power. But as senior correspondent Joanna Gagas reports, advocates had to make concessions on where those boards will exist in order to get it passed. To have subpoena power is power. Assemblywoman Angela McKnight is thrilled to see a bill that she's championed move out of committee this week that would create Civilian Complaint Review Boards, or CCRBs. They would have the authority to investigate alleged instances of police misconduct and give them subpoena power, which advocates have long said is key to CCRB's success. Newark, New Jersey, they have a CCRB, but they don't have subpoena power. And a CCRB without subpoena power is mute, is powerless. The bill A1515 was introduced to this legislature in 2020, although previous versions have been introduced going all the way back to the 1960s. But this bill faced major challenges and was modified to include some key changes. First, rather than CCRBs being allowed throughout the state, they'll only be in four of New Jersey's largest cities, Newark, Patterson, Jersey City, and Trenton. The rollout will now be a five-year pilot program and the CCRBs will now have to wait 120 days to start an investigation, allowing for police internal affairs to investigate an incident first. The CCRB is not to be a replacement for the police. We need the police. I love the police. So what we're doing is allowing them 120 days to start their investigation. Now, after 120 days, the CCRB will be able to conduct their investigation and then it will be running concurrently. So we're just giving them, um, you know, 
let them do their due diligence within 120 days. Larry Hamm has long advocated for civilian complaint review boards with subpoena power. Hamm, who is running against Senator Menendez for his U.S. Senate seat, says these changes were an important compromise to finally push the bill through committee, but he's not happy with the 120-day delay. It makes the review board look like a junior partner to internal affairs. And this is problematic. The whole reason people want police review boards is to enhance police accountability. And if the major control still remains with the police department, some feel that accountability would be to some degree compromised. Civilian review board members would be appointed by mayors and required to undergo training before they can serve. But police unions say this training pales in comparison to that of their internal affairs units, and they oppose the bill altogether. Providing a civilian review board with uh, subpoena power ultimately gets to be almost the fourth bite at the apple to, to go after a police officer who has been alleged to uh, of, of wrongdoing. Whether you look at at the internal affairs process, which is, which is overseen and can be can be taken over by the county prosecutor, in serious instances, you've got s situations that go to the attorney general by law that are investigated by grand juries. Rob Nixon from the NJPBA says the attorney general's list of recent reforms to police oversight have been sufficient to hold officers accountable. And when an officer has gone through all that, or maybe they've they've been they've been they've been punished for that and given their suspension or giving their time off. And now you're going to go and bring in civilians who might not be happy with that result uh, and, and want to have a do over. We would ask, where's the officer's due process rights? With such strong feelings on either side, the road is still long for this bill that needs to get through a full assembly vote next week and then make its way through the Senate all before this legislative session expires. I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. A new statewide group of progressive organizations is calling on candidates in the 2024 U.S. Senate race to help end the party line on New Jersey primary ballots by taking a public stand against the way they're designed. Fair Ballot Alliance NJ says the current method, which is used in 19 out of the state's 21 counties, is unfair because it gives preferential placement to candidates who have the backing of county parties, grouping them in one row or a county line. I asked Wing Kung, the executive director of Action Together New Jersey and a member of the alliance, why they're seeking a change. Wing Kung, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, let me ask you first, what prompted this move uh, for all of these organizations to get together and essentially call on candidates to really take a stand? So it started with the uh, indictment, the latest indictments of Senator Menendez and then Andy Kim, jumped on and announced that he would run for Senate, and then Tammy Murphy came out. But I think what triggered it, the triggering point, was when immediately after her announcement, she got the lines, uh, the endorsements from the five major counties. And I think a lot of us were alarmed at how quickly the um, the race seemed to have been sewn up so quickly. It was in a matter of days. Remind us, when what does research show, because New Jersey is unique in this ballot design, what does research show uh, about the effect of a county line ballot? So the county ba line ballot for Senate and congressional races, there's a 38 point advantage. And this r research was done by Julia Sass Rubin at the Bluestein School. Um, and I think that's just an insurmountable advantage that someone can have. And, you know, as a coalition, we believe that the parties can do whatever they want. They can endorse the candidates. They can run ads, do GOTV, all of that for their endorsed can candidates. We respect both the Democratic and Republican Party because, again, we're working cross-partisan. Um, we respect their own internal party processes. We just think that that campaigning or electioneering should stop at the voters' ballot. Are any of the candidates signaling that they'll support this? So far, we have seen that uh, the campaign of Andy Kim has come out in support. And also on the Republican side, um, I'm not sure if I'm saying his name correctly, but Greg Mele um, has come out also in support as well. So we have one on each side and we hope to hear from more. 
I mean, we know we've talked a lot uh, about the benefits for candidates. So do you anticipate that you're going to be able to get uh, some movement here, just given the amount of money that they can pull in having the, the county endorsements, but also having those power bosses behind them? Well, we have never seen as much coverage of this issue as we have now. And personally, I think at Action Together, we're using this very unique time in New Jersey's history where we've got the sitting senior senator of New Jersey under indictment and also the wife of the sitting governor. And there would be an overlap. Um, they would both be in, uh, in office together if she were to be elected. Um, I think we're using this unique opportunity to really get out and um, one, educate voters about how they can vote and not have to vote uh, you know, down the line, how to prevent overvotes. And secondly, to really get rid of the line and go with an office block display, just like all other states in the nation. Nguyen Kung is the executive director of Action Together and her organization is a member of this new alliance. Nguyen, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And speaking of political elections, make sure you tune into Chatbox with David Cruz tomorrow night. David goes one-on-one -on -one with former New Jersey Senate President Steve Sweeney in his first on-camera interview about his long-anticipated decision to run for governor. That's tomorrow night at 6 p.m. on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. A national debate over how to protect teens from big tech is taking center stage in Trenton, where lawmakers this week moved a bill that'll put restrictions on teens' social media use by requiring parents' permission to sign up for social media accounts. If the proposal becomes law, New Jersey would join a small list of states with similar requirements. But as Ted Goldberg reports, the bill faces serious challenges. When it comes to young people using social media, Assemblyman Herb Conaway says there are tons of issues. The situation is at a crisis level. The federal government has been feckless in, in addressing this problem, and it often occurs it's for the states to take action. A bill sponsored by Conaway would require social media companies to prove parents gave the okay for minors to sign up for social media sites. The bill would also ban, quote, direct messaging between the account and any other adult user that is not linked to the account through adding on the social media platform. As people age, they uh, certainly should have access to more and more information. But uh, a 13-year-old, um, I don't think so. Uh, a 16 year old I don't think so. And a lot of parents ought to be in a position to make that judgment for them, for their families. Social media companies would be on the hook for using third-party apps to verify ages, similar to how mortgage companies use government-issued IDs to do that. There are platforms out there that will uh, very uh, accurately identify who you are if you're trying to uh, seek federal or other benefits. All of those steps are, are unnecessarily infringing on the right to free speech. Um, and that's the primary purpose of social media, right? To be able to go out there and express yourself. The ACLU is concerned that this bill would interfere with free speech. And policy counsel Joe Johnson wonders how to handle online harassment without stomping on First Amendment rights. I think that that's the million dollar question, right? That's what everybody is searching for. And I don't think that there is an easy answer. Kids are used to people having not 10 responses to something, but 100, 1,000 or more. According to the latest data from Pew Research, one third of teens say they use some kind of social media nearly all the time. Conaway says there needs to be a response to that, and parents need more power to monitor and control teen use. There's not a technology in the world that doesn't bring downsides as well, that doesn't have negative externalities, as the economists uh, tell us. Uh, and. Uh, we need to address those ABS brakes on your car or whether it's inspections to make sure that car is safe to operate on the highway. It's impossible to imagine why we shouldn't be holding this new technology to those same levels of public safety standards. It's shameful that this kind of law is needed. Stuart Green is on the state's anti-bullying task force, and he says the problem lies mostly with social media companies exploiting young people completely irresponsible uh, in the way they conduct themselves in terms of engaging minors, addicting minors to the use of it in very calculated ways. Green says it's good to see more regulations aimed at these companies, but he's worried about what might happen to people who really need social media, like people in marginalized communities. These uh, social media sites, other means, are an important way for them to reach out to others 
in that community uh, and, and, and obtain support. So uh, there is that valid concern. Youth often don't have that voice to be able to go out on their sidewalk, to be able to, to, to go into, into the school and say, this is how I feel, because oftentimes they don't have the voice. So being able to go on the social media uh, platforms is very important to be able to find companionship. Conaway's bill moved out of committee earlier this week, and he says he expects the Senate to take up the bill later this week. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Ted Goldberg. In our Spotlight on Business report tonight, interest in New Jersey's medical marijuana program is so low, state regulators are slashing the price to enroll by 80 percent. Registration costs are now $10 every two years, down from 50 for most patients. Officials with the Cannabis Regulatory Commission, which oversees the statewide program, say enrollment has been rapidly declining since New Jersey launched a recreational marijuana market in 2022. But while medical sales are dropping, adult sales continue to grow about 10 percent each quarter. And that's not the only battle state regulators are up against. For more on that, I'm joined by Jeff Brown, executive director of the Cannabis Regulatory Commission. Jeff Brown, thanks uh, for giving us a few minutes of your time. Let me just talk to you about membership within the medicinal program. How low is the roster right now? So where did it start and where does the state stand uh, today? Well, so when we talk about where we started, uh, that really goes back to 2018 when we started to reform the medicinal cannabis program uh, under the leadership of Governor Murphy. Uh, at the time that the administration took over, there were only 17,000 patients in, enrolled in the program and only five dispensaries. Um, we grew those roles over time by adding new conditions uh, and expanding the marketplace to uh, 130,000 patients uh, at our high point. Um, and since we've launched recreational sales, We've started to see it roles decrease, uh, you know, gradually over time. We're now uh, at about mid ninety uh, thousands, uh, about ninety five thousand, just under. Um, and uh, you know, so one of the things we did at our last board meeting was uh, our board approved uh, reduction of fees to enroll in the medicinal cannabis program from it used to be fifty dollars uh, for you know if you didn't qualify for a reduced fee card or twenty dollars if you did um, now it's ten dollars for everybody and then in early 2024 we're going to be releasing uh, free digital ID cards so anybody who is okay with the digital ID card will be able to get a, a enroll for free at no cost and anybody who wants to uh, wants a physical card, um, then they would just pay $10. Is the, the cost to enroll largely what your commission has heard is the biggest barrier for people not enrolling? Because, of course, there have been criticisms uh, from the start of the industry until now that just the sheer cost of the medicinal or recreational marijuana is so high that folks don't want to go through the hurdles of enrolling. You know, we hear from patients that, that the cost of medicinal cannabis is is high. We've seen those prices start to come down. Um, you know, some of the benefits of being in the medicinal cannabis program, there are 48 dispensaries now across the state that serve patients. Um, patients get prioritized in dispensaries where there are dual use, both adult use and rec uh, uh, medicinal. That Those include patient-only hours, designated parking spots, and priority lines for patients. Um, there's no state tax on cannabis. So the, the, the state sales tax has been eliminated on medicinal cannabis, while there is a state sales tax on recreational cannabis, as well as um, as well as an excise fee. Um, we also hear from patients that the cost from doctors uh, and healthcare providers can be prohibitive in, in some cases. Across the river in Pennsylvania, the lowest price that a medicinal patient pays there is about $18 for an ounce. Here in New Jersey, it's $40 for an ounce. So aren't we losing some folks to, to surrounding states and their purchase power is going there? Um, well, we're, look, we're sympathetic about the price of, of medicine being as high as they are. Um, they they have come down in New Jersey significantly. Um, you know, we shared data. I think the the cost of an ounce uh, for medicinal cannabis is uh, for medicinal cannabis is just over three hundred dollars in in New Jersey, and we expect that to come down more. You know, as this market develops um, and there's more competition, prices are going to drop, um, and we're seeing that happen happening now. And and that's only going to continue as more businesses get operational, both to serve medicinal patients and to serve uh, adult use consumers. Jeff Brown is the executive director with New Jersey's Cannabis Regulatory Commission. Jeff, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.
On Wall Street, stocks soared today following the Federal Reserve's final policy meeting of the year, holding its key interest rate steady, which is between five and a quarter and five and a half percent, and signaled it'll likely cut interest rates three times in the new year. Here's how the markets closed today. Support for the Business Report, provided by Rowan University, educating New Jersey leaders, partnering with New Jersey businesses, transforming New Jersey's future. And finally, in a historic first, representatives from nearly 200 countries agreed to a new climate deal in Dubai today at the COP28 Climate Summit, calling on nations around the world to transition away from the chief cause of climate change, fossil fuels. The agreement, which is non-binding, comes after two weeks of painstaking talks at the annual United Nations Summit, but uses vague language some advocates warn could allow loopholes for countries to take little action. The deal falls short of requiring the world to phase out fossil fuels like oil, coal and gas. Major oil exporters like Saudi Arabia and Iraq pushed back against that proposal and instead calls on countries to contribute to global efforts to reduce carbon emissions in ways they see fit, including moving away from fossil fuels to reach net zero by 2050. Climate experts say the breakthrough couldn't come soon enough, taking place at the end of the hottest year in recorded history. And that's going to do it for us tonight. But don't forget to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen anytime. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being here. We'll see you right back here tomorrow night. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And by the PSCG Foundation.